My name is Wendy Fail, and I've been asked to talk to you tonight um, about the project I was involved in over 20 years ago uh, at the University of Newcastle. Um, the project was um, to introduce harvest mice into Northumberland. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the purpose of the research and a little bit about the, the process we went through to actually introduce the mice. So in terms of getting stock, breeding them in captivity, finding a suitable site to um, release them onto, uh, how to acclimatise the, the mice um, prior to release, how we release the mice, the initial outcomes, and then a sort of 20 year reflection um, to see, see what happened. Okay, so there's a harvest mice here. Um, average weight is about six grams. Um, average length for the body is 54 uh, millimetres and the tail is about 50, 51 millimetres. Um, in captivity, they'll live for about uh, between three or five to five years. In the wild, not quite so long, maybe more towards 18, 18 months or so. Um, so back in 2001, when the project started, we did a little bit of research around about, you know, where are harvest mice found, where, uh, what habitats they live in, um, where are they more densely or less densely populated? And right enough, um, our research showed that in, in, the, in the south of, of, of England and, and Britain, they were far more densely populated than they were in the north. Um, certainly in Northumberland, there were only two, two known colonies, um, one near Pontyland and also one up on, well, near the Northumberland coast, which was where our project eventually was, was based. So we were saying, why, why conserve harvest mice? Well, clearly they were a declining species. Um, you know, it's important, I think, to kind of, to find a, a suitable location for these mice to, with, to give them the best chance of survival and to, to sort of reintroduce or to introduce a, a species that was once quite commonplace and quite ubiquitous across the sort of the English and British countryside. Um, also, we, uh, we took, there's a Sam in these photographs here, one of the ladies who was so instrumental in helping with the project. She actually had a pet, um, pet barn owl and we took the uh, some mice and barn owl and some owl pellets into schools around Northumberland to teach children about food chains, about I know, the sort of the different uh, mammals, small mammals that the, the, the owl may, may eat. And the children had great fun dissecting the owl pellets and uh, finding out the different smaller animals or small mammal species that the, um, the, the owl had eaten um, that, that sort of week or so. So why were the why are harvest mice in decline? Essentially, it's all to do with the mechanisation of farming, um, sort of intensification, um, moving away from sort of the cereal rick type farming and different types of farming um, and agricultural practices. Um, essentially, just the loss of their, their habitat um, and not, this, not also through farming but also through urbanization as well um, so taking away lots of sort of the, the, the natural sort of reed bed or the natural um, sort of um, rural um, sort of environments that they, they like to, to, sort of to, to live in. So <laughs> after discussing we want to conserve or reintroduce harvest mice and conserve harvest mice we then had to think about how 
how we're going to do the project and what, what would be the optimum number of, of mice to breed, the logistics of doing the breeding process. Um, so a, a very much a guesstimate was we needed at least a, a start population of 200 animals to, to release and how we're going to get that number of number of animals or number of mice um, you know, with the resources we had. So we, we went out and uh, asked lots of volunteers to take part, schools, um, organisations, satellite breeders essentially, so if they would mind caging and breeding um, mice in, in the comfort of their own school or home or garden shed, as is the case in this, this picture here. Uh, on the understanding there would be some storage issues given this or the prolific breeding rate of, of harvest mice. Um, we didn't quite know where to start in terms of how, how the captive environment would, would look. There was very limited existing literature or research into, into harvest mice. Um, so we're very much kind of going with instinct and using what limited information there was to maybe put it into a more modern modern day sort of concept. So Harris in 1979 did, did some research into, into harvest mice and captive breeding them. Um, and his design was very much um, and well, it wasn't so much fit for purpose. It was fit for purpose at the time, uh, but to my mind, the wooden the wooden design wasn't wasn't the best uh, option. And the little hinged door on the side again, it didn't give the greatest access into into the cage to sort of, sort of find, find the mice or to see how they're getting on. Certainly with the, the sort of the glass frontage, um, I wanted to see all the way around the, the cage. Um, again, the water's great, the vegetation is great, it's perfect, and the mesh on the top's brilliant. But apart from that, we just basically, basically we adapted that design into what you see here, which is very much a modern day uh, example of Harris's work back from 1979, in that we just used plastic or glass aquarium or um, boxes, as in the case of the bottom one there. Um, so we could see all of the way around the mice, and check, check they were okay, um, so, you know, Keep an eye on, on the offspring on the babies being being born um easy to, tr to transport easy to clean say with the, with the likes of the wooden one up was kind of an issue we might not be able to clean it and it wouldn't be quite as sanitary as as um a plastic or a glass glass cage um but like you said you know vegetation it's supplementary food and water was given on a da daily daily basis so the female the species are very much female dominated um when they uh, become pregnant, they do make very distinctive nests that you may or may not have seen made out of the um, vegetation, about the size of a tennis ball. Um, once born, the, the babies stay in the nest for about 11 days. And then as soon as they were born, we took them out of the enclosure and put them into a different enclosure because the silly mother has a tendency to sort of to be cannibalistic and to, um, to eat, her, eat her own offspring. Um, because the very fact of the matter is, um, like I say, very prolific breeders, and sort of two days after giving birth, she then becomes pregnant again. So we so we took the babies out to protect the, the no, to, to protect them from from the mother. Um, and then, in terms of breeding rates, like I said, it's you know, between one and, and nine young per litter, and between one and nine litters per per year. So it's it's a fairly rapid rapid rate um, of, of of breeding. And so yep, yeah, over a two year program. Um, we, we, I say we, because it was very much we effort, um, bred over 200 harvest mice in captivity. Um, some mice were not suitable. We did actually bred, breed more than that number, but some mice weren't suitable to be released as they had been chewed. <laughs> you know, the tails weren't intact or um, they weren't maybe necessarily the healthiest of animals to put out. Um, and they, they were kept in captivity until, until such time they, they they didn't survive or they, they sort of passed on. Um, but the ones we did put out, we wanted to make sure they were the healthiest and the fittest possible. Um, so like I said, that was done through satellite breeders and the sort of logistical sort of systems around get, getting all those mice. And we did, we did manage to hit our, our target, which was great. So where did we actually decide to release them on? So looking at the vegetation and, and looking at the sort of suitable sites from doing some desk-based research from other, other areas, certainly down in Sheffield, did quite a lot of work down there, um, the university down down there. Um, did quite a lot of work in uh, sort of rural parts, well, some more sort of suburban parts of London. Just to look at the populations down there as well. So we identified that the best place in Northumberland would be somewhere with, with reed beds, 
a nice tall vegetation for them you know sort of to to make their nests and, and to scurry around and um we, we sort of came upon a place called east chevington which is just just south of george bay um perfect vegetation we also cho chose a particular site because it's a little bit out of out of the way off the beaten track and we didn't i didn't want um the site to be too well known um in case of sort of, in, sort of human interference um we did believe there was no existing population there at the time but to be 100 percent certain we did do quite a lot of pre-release um activity in terms of trapping um with longworth um longworth traps on a number of occasions um just to make sure that you know, we were, were fully certain there wasn't existing population there on on the site so we find a lot of voles, we find a lot of some shrews, we find a lot of wood mice, but luckily no, no harvest mice. Um, so in the actual release pro uh, process, we had a few options. Um, once we had our stock population ready to go outside, we could have just put them all out at once and let them get on with it. We could have um, put half out at once. We could have done what we did in the end was just like a staggered release um i didn't want to put all my animals out at the same time and let them fend for themselves without having some sort of acclimatization period had in the event of some catastrophic incident happened all our hard work would have been completely lost and our stock of mice would have just gone like that um i'm not saying it was the right thing to do uh, um, i mean there are arguments for and against acclimatization periods but i believed in this occasion this is the, this is the approach that I wanted wanted to take to take. Um, and yes, it did take longer to do it, but it was just to my mind more responsible. Um, so what did we do? We made um, large outdoor enclosures, um, wooden frame, some mesh all the way around base as well. I put them onto the site in about the March time uh, of, of the release year. I left them there for three months to enable the vegetation to grow up nice and thick inside. You can see in the photographs how dense it is. Again, this is my um, assistant Sam. Um, he was uh, to, to, to sort, of, to sort of helping out with the with the project, and she's here actually releasing um, some of the mice into the acclimatization chambers. We had ten of those all told on the site, um, of which at each time eight mice were put in to each chamber over the course of I believe it was six six to eight eight different occasions. Um, like I said before, you know, there was other options we could have used um, for the acclimatization. Um, but as I've mentioned just briefly before, you know, I didn't want to go down a mass scale or no acclimatization. Um, I didn't want to individually house the mice either. I wanted to have them, you know, living in, in a sort of a, a mock environment that they may well, may well encounter in, in the real, real world. So there's a big release here there's so some of our lovely volunteers who came along to help and um so obviously putting some water in and we put some some millet and some 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 uh, other food stuffs in in the enclosures as part of the um sort of soft staggered release um process so we left them in the cages with the doors closed for a week and then at the end of that week we then unscrewed the doors by a week by, by about yeah half an inch or so uh, three uh, for three days to allow the mice to escape into the environment. Um, at that point in time, we then replenished the um, chambers with the next set of mice. Um, being mindful that yes, not all the mice would have escaped in that time or gone out into the, the wider wider area in that time, um, but safe in the knowledge we weren't bombarding the, com the the chambers with too many mice at once as well. As well. Like I said, that happened over eight weeks and we sort of consulted with the Wildlife Trust and the University of Newcastle and other professionals um, on, on that process to sort of note so they knew what we were doing and we all agreed that was the best approach to take because obviously the land was owned by the Wildlife Trust, um, taking counsel from other professionals at other universities and also the University of Newcastle to, of which this research was affiliated. Um, so did it work? So, um, after all the mice had been released and put into the chambers and uh, allowed to, to escape, we did some follow up follow up work and that involved some post release long with trapping. Um, that did have a limited success in that we only caught one live harvest mouse. Um, well, disappointing, it wasn't fully unexpected. Um, 
harvest mice are particularly difficult to catch in along with traps as anyone who's done it before will will know because of their, their sort of lightweight um we did question you know is it because they haven't survived um was it because we weren't putting enough traps out um was it were they in the wrong location um were the other species on sites such as the wood mice and the voles setting the traps off too quickly to then mean the mice weren't getting caught and also the one thing that we did think about is obviously um harvest mice live in sort of three-dimensional sort of space and we've only trapped at ground level could we have possibly trapped um at sort of mid mid height to um to see if they were in in that that sort of plane as well um however when we didn't catch any mice we did a year after um release find four longworth traps at ground level the following winter um not the mice just the long just just the nests within the within the longworth traps and one was found in the summer as well showing that while we didn't physically see the, the mice themselves we saw evidence that they had survived um at least a year year and a half after after release um and there's myself and sam holding the fruits of our labor there with um with along with traps and and the 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 nests that we found inside them that was that was quite a pleasing result um again it wasn't perfect but it was kind of pleasing um at that point in time so after that time this, this the project ceased to so, sort of cease ceased to exist in its form in about 2007 in the fact that i moved on to a different job and the project sort of came to a natural end and while i never sort of lost sight of what happened on site there was never an option to go, go back and do any any more research or any more trapping or any more um identification to see if the, the project was was it successful or not and kind of walked away not not knowing fully the outcome probably thinking mm, you know maybe it had work, hadn't worked um however roll on 20 years and the wildlife trust um undertook it well are still doing a project called catch my drift and as part of that they knew the legacy of the work i did all those years ago and they um we did all those years ago and they um they undertook some small mammal trapping to see if the, if the mice were still there and lo and behold they they caught harvest mice uh, or found evidence of harvest mice um at the site of which i then received a phone call from sam telling me the amazing news and after that it just the phone didn't stop ringing um we had calls from the bbc the guardian the i paper bbc wildlife magazine spring watch asking for um quotes and asking for um information about the project and what we did and, and what isn't it fabulous news that all these years later we've actually identified that what, what we did myself and sam and all the other nation of volunteer the army of volunteers did actually actually work and on the back of that um the wildlife trust have now uh, received a donation i believe to um to put more mice out onto the site i believe it's up to 300 mice to bolster the population that we put out all those all those years ago um and it's a really really lovely success story that i never anticipated would happen um i didn't certainly didn't expect the amount of publicity that came came from it um on reflection was a staggered release the right thing to do well i would argue yes it was because this is the outcome you know you can see now clearly it has worked and not to say that had we done a, a non-staggered release or non-acclimatization it wouldn't have worked but the way we did it did work and i like to think that what, what we did uh, all those years ago has maybe set a nice um sort of template or a framework or a blueprint for anyone else who wants to do any sort of harvest mouse mice or um any other sort of reinstruction with small mammals to so maybe to maybe use that um and under, under the knowledge that, that it possibly will will work and help to to sort of conserve and introduce a species that was in decline um so i guess the last thing is to say you know first of all well thank you to all the the the, the absolute army of, of volunteer breeders that that helped and the project wouldn't have been possible without them um 
I mean, amazing thanks go to Sam Talbot and what was then Castle Morbid Borough Council for their 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 support. I, you know, I couldn't ask for anything better or anything any more. Sam gave everything to this project, and she needs to sort of just, the same amount of praise as I do, really. Uh, the Wildlife Trust again, it was their land, and they they agreed to let us use their land for this the project and put faith in our in our in our sort of naivety, I suppose, and what, what we're doing and backed us up the whole way. Uh, the University of Newcastle and also Northumberland County Council for their for their support as well in, in um, helping us achieve achieve um, the, the goals of, of the project. Um, and so pretty much that's the um, end of my presentation um, this evening. Um, if you've got any questions, I, mean, I very much skipped over the project and it was it was far more to it than what I've spoken about. Um, so this is just very much a flavour of what, what we did. Um, there's a lot more research that went behind the actual process, such as hair tube sampling, uh, popping out tennis balls, you know, see if they would use those in the, in the field as well or, or not. Um, but if anyone would, has any questions or would like some advice or would like a chat uh, about anything I've spoken about this evening, please feel free to drop me an email at wendy.fail at northumberland.gov.uk and I'll be more than happy to um, to, uh, to, to chat with you um, and uh, advise. Thanks very much, guys. Good evening. Bye.